All right, guys, my name is Chris, and this is your 2021 Flying Cloud 30 bunk. We're going to start right here with your propane service. You have two 30 pound bottles. They are both full. And this is an automatic regulator, so if you're running with both bottles open, when you run one bottle empty, it's going to automatically switch over to the other bottle. There is a little post on the side of this regulator that will determine initially which bottle it pulls from, provided that bottle is open. Now I'm going to recommend that you run one bottle open and run one bottle closed because there is no gauge, and so that way when you run this bottle empty, you'll have to physically come out here and open the other bottle. So now you know I'm running off of my second bottle. I can be a little more conservative with my propane and start thinking about getting this other bottle filled up. We're going to leave this one open for now so that we can test a few things on the inside. I will also point out you have an external LP port over here on the side of the battery box. It is a pre-regulated 25,000 BTU service. It's going to be good for running a little camping stove or maybe even a little space heater. This is your battery box and inside here you have AGM batteries. So they're going to be maintenance free. Two fuses I'd like you to be aware of. On this red line is a really big 30 amp blade fuse. This is for your tongue jack. Now your tongue jack is power. It does have a light in case you need to connect at night. This particular tongue jack does not stop immediately when you release the trigger. So you want to make sure it comes to a stop before you reverse directions. But that's the reason why we've got that big blade fuse because it will over amp a little bit. There is a manual crank that will fit right here on the top. So if you've lost power to the jack, you will still be able to crank it on and off your tow vehicle. But if you have lost power, the first thing I want you to check is that blade fuse because this tongue jack is wired directly into your batteries. Also in your battery compartment is another 15 amp blade fuse, as on this little black line right here. This blade fuse is going to be for this solar plug right here. Now, <clears throat> there are solar panels permanently mounted to the trailer, but you can add an additional auxiliary solar panel. Plug it in right here, it's already wired into your batteries and from there it will continue to charge your batteries and it will augment the onboard solar capacity. Next to that solar plug is your spare tire. So there's a cotter pin holding that slide pin. Pull those, that handle will drop down, your spare is going to slide out this direction. It's going to be 80 PSI on your spare tire, just like your road tires. Now you have a large storage compartment here in the front. And in here we're going to find your 50 to 30 amp drop pigtail. So if you're staying at a camping site that only offers a 30 amp service, you'll still be able to use every item in the trailer. It will limit you to one air conditioner, but it will be whichever one you turn on first, not one specific air conditioner. Now the light inside of here will go out when you hit your master disconnect, but I am going to recommend that you turn as many lights off as possible so that way when you turn the disconnect back on, it's not a large surge of electricity. We'll come around the corner here. And we've got your gross vehicle weight and tire pressure sticker. Again, it's going to be 80 PSI on your tires. You want to maintain that pressure for best towing and also best tire wear. This stud here and its friend down there at the end, as well as their twins on the other side, will drop your stabilizer jacks down. When we get down here to the end, we're going to drop one of those down so you can see how that works. Moving down, we've got the exhaust for your furnace. Now down here in Texas, we have mud dauber wasps. So if you live in Texas, they're going to want to crawl inside there build a little mud nest and clog that up. We do sell a little screen that will keep those bugs out. I highly recommend you get that. That is typically the number one cause for furnace failure here in Texas. Down below that is a tube that's going to hold a 15 foot collapsible sewer line. This is just for storage. Moving back, we've got your outside shower. If you're using this shower with the onboard fresh water tank to get pressure here, you will have to turn on the onboard water pump. The city water connection does provide pressure throughout the trailer. It will provide pressure here as well. When you winterize the trailer, it's very important for you to remember to disconnect this wand and drain it. This wand is made of plastic. It is also outside of the insulation. I've seen a lot of these come back cracked. I will actually capture the little rubber gasket right here, which is where you would hang the wand while you're soaping up, and I will stow it just like this. As long as you leave these knobs turned off, you won't have any water leaking out here. And it's just as simple as connecting them back together if you needed to use it. That way you don't forget. Next is going to be the fill port for your onboard water tank. This is simply a gravity fill, so you'll stick your water hose in here and fill it up. 
I'm going to show you how you can set up the onboard tank monitor so that you can look in the door and watch the status of your tanks. But if you overfill the freshwater tank, it will come out of this vent port here and not inside the trailer. The drain for the freshwater tank is below in between the two tires. There's a little white pet cock. You turn that towards the rear and it will slowly drain out the bottom. You want to make sure you're cycling through the water in your fresh tank every two weeks. After two weeks, it will start to taste a little stale. And if you store the trailer in the summertime with water in your fresh tank and it's hot outside, after about 30 days, that hot water will start to smell like feet. So if you're storing in the summertime, make sure you open that drain and drain it. Your camp power comes in here. It's a 50 amp service on this trailer at 110 volts. And this is your shore cord. It is 25 feet long. Next to that, we have a city water connection. This is where you will connect your water hose at your camping site for your on-demand water. This has a built-in 50 PSI regulator, so do not add an external water regulator or you won't get any water pressure passing through. But it is plumbed through the onboard water pump, so if the site you're staying at has weak water pressure, you can turn on the onboard water pump and it will boost the pressure at your faucets, but you are not filling the onboard tank through this port, only through the port forward. Below that is your waste cleanout valve. When you attach your water line here, it puts water directly into the black waste tank, which is where the toilet empties. It's designed to help you clean that out. Your clean out is down below. You do have a light in case you need to connect at night. On the left hand side, the auxiliary holding tank is going to be your gray tank. And on the right hand side, the main tank is going to be the black tank. You always begin with the black tank. You want to set up the monitor inside so that you can watch the status and attach your water line to your waste clean out valve. Start introducing fresh water. Before you pull the valve on the black waste tank, you must top the black tank all the way up to 100% with fresh water. This is a gravity drain, so you'll need that maximum volume of water pressure to help push all that solid waste out the first time. When you see the flow diminish here, close the valve and continue to allow water to backfill until it's 100% full again. You're going to do this five or six times until that flow has gone from pretty muddy to pretty clear. Once it's as clean as you can stand, close the valve for the final time. Continue to allow water to backfill into the black tank until it reads about 5% on your waste tank gauge. At that point, turn your water off, go inside and add your tank chemical to the toilet. You should allow the trailer to set around all the time with about this much water on the bottom of the waste tank. So as you're towing around, that water is sloshing around, keeping the sides clean so your sensors read really good. And any waste residue that was left behind will be trapped in that chemically treated water and it will exit the next time you empty the waste tank. At this point, your toilet would be ready for use. You would only need to add a little water to the bowl and go ahead and do your business. And even if it freezes, if it's only this much water on the bottom of the waste tank, you're gonna have plenty of expansion space inside there. Once you're finished with the black tank, come outside and do the gray tank second. This is gonna be mostly soapy water runoff from your sinks and showers. It's gonna help you wash this pipe out. Do not ever open both valves at the same time. If you do, the black will flow into the gray tank and contaminate it. And do not leave your valves open at your camping site. You can keep your sewer line attached. If you have a sewer connection, that's fine, but you must leave the valve shut until you're actually empty in the waste. If you left the black tank valve open, the water that you need to catch the things that you're putting in the toilet is gonna to run out. They're gonna to fall to the bottom of the tank and when they dry out, they're gonna to begin to smell. Less important for the gray tank, but if you left that valve open, insects or rodents could crawl up inside there and build a nest inside the onboard tank. So you can keep your hose attached, that's fine, but you must leave the valve shut until you're actually empty in the waste. All right, so up here we've got the back side of your vent hood. There are two little tabs that are holding this door shut. You want to push those up and out of the way to allow it to vent. You use these tabs to keep the door shut when you're towing. This door is made of plastic, and over time it will damage itself. Coming back here, we have a cable and a satellite port. They are labeled, and they terminate in different places inside the trailer. So when we get inside, we'll talk a little more about that. In your bumper or your trunk storage is where we're going to find the manual crank for your stabilizer jacks. Now, before you drop the stabilizers down, it's very important for you to remember to level the trailer front to back with the tongue jack and also disconnect your tow vehicle. If you operate the, the tongue jack with the stabilizers down, it will overpower and crush them. They are designed to keep the trailer from rocking. They cannot support the full weight of the trailer. Also, if your camping site is unlevel side to side, you need to pull that low side up on some blocks and level it beforehand. Again, these are just stabilizer jacks. 
Once you've got the trailer level, it is as simple as just cranking it on down. I will crank it down until the foot touches the ground and then give it just a little extra pressure. The most important thing for you to remember about your stabilizer jacks is to bring them back up before you tow out. If you fail to do so, you will simply rip the undercarriage out from under your trailer. So please do not do that. All right. So the bumper or the trunk storage, unlike the rest of the storage compartments on the trailer, is not considered secure or dry. When it is closed, it's still open here on the ends, and these little tabs are all that's holding it shut. So don't put anything in there that you're worried about getting wet. You do have another secure and dry storage compartment above. Inside here, we'll turn the light off. And finally, at the top, in the back, this backup camera has a microphone. So whoever's back here giving directions, if you speak towards the camera, you can be heard wherever the monitor is. We'll come around the corner here. One more outside storage compartment. And we'll catch that light right here. Next to that is your water heater. For 2021, we have on-demand water heaters. So that's gonna be virtually maintenance free. I will mention that you are going to have a hot exhaust coming out of here, so you make sure you do not block this with anything flammable like a back of a fabric chair. Next is just a dual 110 plug. It's just your standard 15 amp 110. And then this is going to be the back side of your refrigerator. This is service access for us. It allows us to work on the refrigerator without pulling the refrigerator out, but do not be tempted to use it for storage. Anything that you store inside there will bounce around and damage those electronic components. And of course, it needs that airspace to operate properly. Above that, we do have a patio light. And inside the door here, we have your awning tool. So we're going to pull the awning out on this side. You do have two different style travel latches. You have one that is a hook that you want to rotate up and out of the way. And then one on either end that will unscrew. These are already unscrewed. When you pull the awning out, it is very important for you to remember to pull away from the trailer and not straight down so you don't scratch the side. Pull it out until the flap drops out. Come down here to the end. Grab the stabilizer arm and place it up here on the head. You always place it here and never here. If you put it here, it's gonna bend right there and it's gonna break off. Once we've got it in place, we'll spear it forward to lock it, just like so. We'll engage the middle. And finally come down here to the end. Now at this point we can start to extend it. Now you do have four of these little notches and you can do two at a time. I will typically start with one. We'll do a couple down here. And then we'll come down here and do a couple more. All right. So you'll notice how I've got this one at an angle. Like all of the awnings on your trailer, this is a sun shade. So if you have more sunlight coming in from one direction or another, having it at an angle is totally appropriate. It is not a heavy wind or a heavy rain shade. It is designed to be lightweight. It cannot take the torque of a heavy wind and heavy winds always accompany a heavy rain. So if it starts to blow or pour, you wanna make sure you fold it back in. Your strap is going to roll up. And eventually it will tuck into this loop up here. I will also mention you have an LED light strip across the top that is on a dimmer switch so we can dim that down. Or turn it off completely. Follow me around the corner, we'll pull your other awnings out. 
The awning on the rear does not have a latch, so it's going to pull straight out. These tabs must be rotated all the way around and captured here. They are simply too long to go this way. So all the way around. And of course this guy here is going to roll up and Velcro out of your view. One more awning around the corner. I'm sorry, two more awnings around the corner. We'll disengage the travel latch. and capture the strap on this hook right here. Finally one here. Just like so. All right. Now you can use the awning tool to return the awnings if you need to. You're going to capture it like so. You'll run it to right about there and let it snap in those last couple inches so it's nice and tight and it doesn't wrinkle. Please make sure you remember to re-engage your travel latch. So we're going to pull here to release, drop a couple of notches, come down to the other end. Same thing. Pull here to release, set this on the travel rest. We're just going to set this one in place, don't have to lock it. We'll do the middle one next, pull here to release. Now this one does need to be latched into place, so you'll put the little end here on the tab and pull it down to lock it in place. Finally, we'll drop this last notch here. Make sure once you pull this one that you got a hold of it so it doesn't come folding in on its own. And we'll just set this one on the travel rest, just like so. And you can either grab the flap, put your hand up here until you can get down to the strap, give it a little help in, and like I mentioned, use your awning tool. To return it. We'll go ahead and re-engage these travel latches. Come down here and do the other end. We're going to stash this back in the bumper storage. All right, so the next thing we'll go over is the main door. This main door was built in a pair with this screen door. And it takes 11 hours to install them, so we go to great lengths not to replace one. Please make sure that you have them secured together when you close them. The number one reason that this screen door gets damaged is because someone has closed the main door onto it. They were designed to be closed as a pair. You do have a thick rubber gasket and a two-stage latch, so if you do not close the door, 
with enough force, that second stage does not engage. Now you can push it through, but the door was designed to be slammed, so give it just a little bit of force. The large key here is going to be for your deadbolt, and the smaller key will be for the door latch. The deadbolt on this trailer is a post. You want to take care that this is not sticking out when you go to slam the door. Use this post when you're towing. It's going to do a much better job of keeping the door shut than this locking claw. When this is locked, it's still open. And even though it will close around that stud, there's going to be a gap at the back. And theoretically, the trailer could get twisted or tweaked and the door could come flying open. This post will prevent that. Take care that you do not leave your key in the door and open your door all the way. You're going to put a nice dent in the side of your trailer. You will also break off your key. It is also possible to lock the door and close it. So I always recommend you make just a plain copy of the latch key and find a secure place on the trailer to store that. To fold the step in, the first thing you'll do is fold the lower step straight up and roll it onto the upper step. From here, you're gonna lift slightly to release the hinges and you're gonna slam it up underneath. Make sure when you do so, you do so from the center and not the side so you don't pinch your fingers. To release, you grab one or the other, they are connected. But when you pull these up, pull them up and hold them up. Don't just pop them so they don't catch that upper step as it comes by. Make sure both sides are secure and then grab the rear edge of the step lifting up. Push that front edge back and roll it all the way around, just like so. Now, if you'll follow me inside, I will point out we've got a fire extinguisher right here by the door. Above that, we have your master battery disconnect, turns every item in the trailer off, including the refrigerator. Two light switches here, one for the step light right by the door and the other for the porch light on the side. Of course, your overhead ceiling light is on a dimmer switch just like the awning was. Coming in here to the bedroom, the main bed will lift and you can access some storage below. Over here on the wall, the TV is on a travel bracket, so pull the strap and it will come away from the wall. You wanna make sure you have that secured before you tow out. And of course, the overhead light in the bedroom is also on a dimmer switch. We got a little storage cabinets here on either side, in addition to one above the bed. The lights above the bed are on their own switches, right there at the top of the light. You've got a carbon monoxide detector in here that has a nine volt battery. That battery is good for six months. Over here, we have your smoke detector. Same nine volt battery, good for six months. Below that is your DVD player, your Blu-ray player, also your radio, and the termination point for your satellite. So behind this port, or behind this box rather, is a bare coax for your signal in and an HDMI cable for your signal out. You can semi-permanently mount your receiver up here, connect your dish to the side via the satellite port, and once you connect the receiver up in here, the signal will pass through to the HDMI one port, which is currently where the DVD player is. All right, and here's your monitor for your backup camera. Heading over this direction, to make the dinette into a bed, we're going to pull these levers towards us. We're going to push straight down. Now, if we were going for the bed, we would simply push the cushions out of the way and go all the way down to the wood and take the little short ends off of the couch and put them here in the center. This is spring-loaded, so it will return on its own. And it can be pivoted. There's also a bracket under here that will allow it to slide. Up here on the wall, we have another TV, and on the side, you're going to find the power for your digital antenna booster. On that white plate, when that green light is lit, it's powering the digital antenna on the roof. It's allowing you to pull in all your local channels. That is actually a two-way switch, so if we press this black button, where is it? the light goes out and is now allowing the signal to pass through from the cable port. So the satellite port terminates where the radio port where the radio is and the cable port terminates here but in order to get the signal to pass through you must turn the digital antenna booster off. On this side we have your microwave. On this one it's just a microwave. This microwave will only be available when you're plugged into your 110 power source. Up here on the wall we have your sea level monitor. It's going to give you your battery voltage 
13.4 volts and also the levels of your water tank. So your fresh tank is at 25% full, the gray tank is empty, and the black tank is at 6% full. On any of the water tanks, when you press the button twice, the little red dot will appear. It's gonna hold that value on the screen for about five minutes. So while you're filling and emptying, you can look in the window and watch the status of your tanks. Also, your water pump is here. It's an on-demand water pump. It's gonna pressure up and stop, and it will not come back on until you create a demand. Next to that, we have your vent hood with a light, and below we have your range. Of course, this range is propane powered, so initially you're gonna to have to open the propane bottles. We'll simply turn it to the light setting, click the igniter. Now, this lid is tempered glass, so if you've been cooking on these and they're nice and hot, give them a chance to cool. You don't want this thing to shatter. Down below, the oven will have to be lit with a kitchen match or a long lighter. You will do that right behind this little silver tab here. And then of course the light switch operates just the knob lights or the knob and the oven light as well. Over here on this side we have your refrigerator. This refrigerator has two sources. It has a 110 power source and a gas power source. Of course your on off switch is here and then five is the coldest temperature, one is the warmest. In auto it's going to pull from your 110 power source first. If it fails to detect 110, it will automatically switch over to the propane. You can force that by pressing this button here. You'll hear a few clicks, and then it will just kind of run off of propane. If it fails to light, you'll get a little orange check light right here indicating that it tried to light off of propane and did not succeed. This refrigerator is gonna take seven or eight hours to get completely cold. We are gonna recommend the night before you leave, plug the trailer into your 110 power and get it cold overnight. Any food that you're gonna put inside, get that food cold before you put it inside the fridge. If you put cold food in a cold refrigerator and close the door, as long as you leave the door shut, it will stay cold in there for seven or eight hours without an additional power source. One other thing I will mention is that regardless of what source you're running the refrigerator on, when you hit the master disconnect, the refrigerator will turn off. So it's currently running off of propane. We're gonna give it back to the 110 power, and then we're gonna turn it off. And then of course your refrigerator here. Down below we have your main breaker and fuse box. All of your breakers are listed on this sticker here. The one at the end is your GFI reset. Just like at home, it cannot be turned right back on. It must be turned all the way off. It will also not reset unless you're connected to a 110 power source. All of your fuses are mostly just your standard 15 amp blade fuse and they are listed on this sticker right here. When one goes out, you'll have a little red LED light that will appear next to it that you can see through this window here. Now down below we have your propane detector. I'm gonna set this one off. Red light and squealing means you have a propane leak. You need to exit the trailer, go outside, close up your bottles, and come back inside and start looking to see what you left turned on. But this one is wired directly to the battery, so when you first add power to the trailer, the light will be red, but it will be silent. The key is it needs to be both making noise and red light to indicate a leak. In here, we have some storage. We also have a box of goodies. This light, just like the light in your outside storage compartments, will go out when you hit the master disconnect, but that's just another one that's a good one to turn off. Here in the bedroom, carbon monoxide detector again, good for six months. The bunk has a 150 pound weight limit and there's a little step right here as well as a switch to turn on and off the overhead light. Coming into the bathroom, it's very important for your hand to follow this. You do not want to allow this mechanism to bang all the way open. It will damage itself over time. So just go ahead and follow it open. There is a clothesline inside here that can be stretched across and tightened down. It's going to be good for your bathing suits or your dish towels, but no bath towels. The shower head does have a pause feature so you can pause the water while you're soaping up. And then you have a macerator toilet on this unit. So we have two switches here on the wall. We're gonna go ahead and open up the toilet. This switch will flush and add water simultaneously. The one next to it, when you press up, simply fills the bowl with water and the press down is the flush. Below that is a black tank indicator. So if you fill the black tank to 100% full, a red light will come on here that's gonna disable your toilet so it cannot force that waste into a completely full 
waste tank. Water heater is here on the wall. 118 degrees is about where most folks are comfortable with the water temperature. It will go all the way up to 124 and down as low as 96 degrees. We will turn this over to hot and turn it on. It will come on automatically. They're going to get it be an indication that it's working. We'll get a little flame here in the middle when it lights and then within about a minute we'll have hot water. All right, so there's the flame. Temperature's starting to go up. This water is cold, still cold. And there goes the cold, just a touch of warmth. And there comes the heat. So like I said, within about a minute, you're gonna have hot water. And as long as you have propane and water flowing through this, it's almost limitless hot water. Of course, the overhead light is on a switch. These can be turned down, so they don't have to be all four of them at the same time. Still operates from the switch. In between, we have a manual vent fan, so we're going to push this one open. Little red button is going to turn it on and pull it shut. So bear in mind, this one is fully manual, so if it starts to rain, you want to make sure you go ahead and close that. On our way out, we're going to talk about the HVAC control. That's right here below the TV. Now you have two zones in this trailer. The large zone is going to be zone one by mode. The first option we'll have is the air conditioner. The air conditioner does not come on immediately. It takes just a few moments for it to charge the capacitors. It's also trying to determine if it has enough power to operate. You'll see a little hourglass symbol here. The first thing that's going to happen is the fan comes on, but the compressor does not come on until the hourglass goes out, usually within about 30 seconds of the fan coming off. So we'll wait just a second for that. So right there was the compressor kicking on. Now you'll notice at the bottom you have a fan symbol and it says auto. You do have a three speed fan. We're gonna turn it down to low. It takes just a second for it to slow down. However, I'm gonna recommend that you leave it in auto as the default so that way when you turn the fan on, it doesn't come on immediately when you turn the control panel on. By mode, we have an auto at the top. The auto at the top will automatically cycle between the air conditioner and the heat pump depending on your ambient temperature and what you have this set on. The next option is going to be the heat pump. It does make a little squishy sound as it switches over, so we'll listen for that. Just like so. Now the heat pump is going to operate down to 50 degrees ambient temperature. After that, you're going to want to switch over to the furnace. The furnace is going to be your next option. The furnace is going to disable the overhead, and it will come on down below separately. Now this furnace does not light immediately. It's going to take about 10 seconds for it to clear the combustion chamber. You'll hear a real fast ignition sound, and then it does kind of wail at you once it's lit. So we're going to listen for that. Just like so, very faint wailing sound. Now I will mention that you can turn on the overhead fan by selecting a fan speed, and that will draw that heated air up into the ducting and redistribute it throughout the trailer. Just like so. We'll cycle back through to auto. And then after the furnace on Zone one, we'll have a fan only and then off. So we're gonna switch zones. You'll notice how as it turned off, the furnace is still running. The furnace has a two minute cool down cycle that you wanna to allow to finish before you take the power from the trailer. On zone two, we're gonna have the same options. So the first option will be the air conditioner and just like on zone one, it does not light immediately. It's gonna take just a few moments for it to charge the capacitor and then the fan will come on and then eventually the compressor as well. So we're going to wait for that. So there's the overhead fan. We're still waiting on the compressor. All right, so just like that, the compressor kicked on. Now by mode, we're going to have the same options. So we have the auto at the top, which automatically switches between the heat pump and the air conditioner. The heat pump, we'll listen for the squish. Squish. Now on zone two, after the heat pump is the fan only option and then off. You wanna make sure that you cycle through to off on both zones before you turn the control panel off. That way when you turn it back on, it does not come back on to whatever setting you had on previously. 
If you'll come over here, we've got your solar charge indicator right here. Of course, we're inside, so it's indicating zero watts. And below that is your inverter control. The inverter is going to allow you to run the TVs in one plug off of just the batteries. Every other item in the trailer that works off the batteries will already work. So we've got 110 volts coming through and 13.4 volts. Now to turn this off, you will have to hold the button down until it turns itself off. But you do not need to have the inverter on if you're plugged into your shore power, only if you're boondocking. Finally, we have two fantastic exhaust fans. Um, they both are the same, so we'll just use this one to demonstrate. The only difference between the two is the one in the bedroom area has a window shade. So what we'll do now is turn it all the way off. It does have a powered lid motor here. Of course, nothing will happen until we select a fan speed here. Fan is turned on here. It is a three-speed fan. And bear in mind, this is drawing heat out. Also have a crude thermostat here, so in between these clicks, when the temperature crosses that threshold, it will turn itself off and on. This has a rain sensor, so if it gathers enough moisture, it will close on its own, and when it does, it will turn itself off. I want to mention that the lid is made of plastic, so you do not want to tow with it open. And finally, there is a four amp glass fuse here. So if something stops that fan blade, it's going to burn up this fuse instead of burn up the fan motor. Well, guys, that's it for your walkthrough. I want to thank you very much for your time. Thanks for watching our video. If you have any questions or have any recommendations on content you'd like to see, make sure to drop a comment in the comment section below. If you enjoy our content, give us a like and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks again from Airstream DFW.